Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I know there's a, always a lot of competing events, and it's always very difficult to choose where to go. And uh, also the weather competes, you know, it's pleasant weather in this, in this season here in the Gulf. So thank you very much for being here. I'm going to keep it really brief, because we, we, we really put together this event with our partners and with our members in the spirit of and these things go very, very fast. But let me tell you in a few words, why did we think that this idea of mixing constituencies was important for us and that we could offer that to the World Urban Forum in this edition? Well, because we do not conceive in the Slocat Partnership mobility and transport just as moving people from A to B. We are the international partnership that brings together a wealth of different stakeholders from the transport community who actually also have got the ambition of talking to other stakeholders within other communities. If Mobility and transport in our current cities is not just about moving people from A to B, it's because, about, it's because it is about powering livelihoods and giving equitable access to socio-economic opportunity to everybody living in a city. And that is particularly important for us in the way we want to conceive our work. That means that it's got to be for women and men, that it's got to be for people of all ages and of all abilities, and that it's got to be uh, making sure that we don't leave anybody behind and that those living in the most vulnerable uh, uh, situations can afford and can access transport and use it as a way to access their life and, 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 their, and their also leisure opportunities. Um, what does it mean in practical terms, therefore? It perhaps means interrogating a series of notions that we take for granted. It means interrogating what is the shape of our cities, particularly since we know that urbanization is a demographic trend of the 21st century and that many more urban environments are going to be expanding or are going to be built in the next decade. So what is going to be the shape? What is the type of planning? How do we make sure that urban planners and transport planners work together? What is the type of infrastructure we need to put out there that doesn't lock us in in pervasive uses that exclude people and that are perhaps not adapted to climate change? What is the type of projects we're going to finance? Uh, what is the use we're going to give to the innovation we got around shared mobility? All those scooters that are populated in cities, all those electric bikes, all those shared mobility systems. How are we going to put all that innovation at the service of cities that are accessible for everyone and that everybody can move freely around it? That's very much what we want to discuss today and that's why I would really like to thank our members of the Slocat Partnership who are here today to make an, uh, this happen and to our partners out of the, of the partnership as well to the other constituencies who very, um, um, uh, I think, elegantly and, and very generously accepted the invitation of having this conversation. So thank you very much again, and I pass it back to Chris, who's going to be our MC for the whole event. Um, but let's keep it really like the conversation we wanted. Let's try not to be very stiff, okay? It's supposed to be a networking event, so I would really like to ask you to help us make it such a networking event and not just a panel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Marusha, for summarizing the purpose of why we're here. And it's true, this is a networking event. We want to bring different constituencies and groups together to have a proper dialogue and conversation with different people from the transport sector. And so this is a great place to do that. So thank you very much, Marusha, for introducing the purpose of our event. So without further ado, I'd like to get into the first segment of our wider networking event about these presentations of challenges and solutions to sustainable urban mobility. So I'd like to welcome to the stage a number of different representatives of key constituencies of which urban mobility is an important part of their lives, um, of which is an important part of their education, of getting to work, of going to school, of interacting with other people, engaging in society. Let me bring to the stage three very special and important people um, who are very active at this WOOF, often enough. Uh, we have first Hannes Julian Lagrelius. He is the program officer from the World Blind Union and the co-chair of the General Assembly of Partners, Partner Constituent Group for Persons with Disabilities. Then we have Sharifa Noriza, who is the Asia Pacific Regional Caucus Coordinator of the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. And last but not least, Kalpana Vishwanath, the CEO of Safety Pin and a board member of the SLOCAD Partnership. So please join us on stage. I'm very happy that we're allowed to speak, though it's a silent event. Uh, <laughs> It would have been very inaccessible if it was a silent event, especially for the main constituency I represent who are the blind and partially sighted within the World Blind Union. So we represent 253 million blind and partially sighted. But as it also was mentioned by Christopher, I'm also the co-chair of the General Assembly of Partners, partner constituency group of persons with disabilities, um, etc. So I will try to keep it very brief 
uh, because I can't summarize uh, with enough mandate, I would say, all the challenges faced by persons with disabilities in urban mobility and public transport in the different regions of the world. But in my experience, what we have seen in many contexts is, of course, a sustained culture of exclusion and marginalization, both contributing to inaccessible transport, but also leading and sustaining marginalization, ex exclusion, and in turn, isolations. Often, cities have adopted practices which has not always been what they intended to actually result in. And when cities and local governments adopt accessibility laws or legislations or regulations, we have many records of them failing because those co processes of drafting such guidelines have not been consultative. They have not included the active participation of persons with disabilities, and that's also risk uh, furthering exclusion. Um, I usually take one example of investments in accessibility in infrastructure and the built environment, drawing upon our lessons learned from the work with universal design and accessibility in the investment and fin from a financial perspective. Studies show that investing early in accessibility in universal design can, maybe you can incur 1% extra on in the total investment. But if you wait a few years and you realize that the investments made may have been transport or built environment, you realize that we had to retrofit this environment. So we need specialized design, ad hoc solutions to actually, to actually make the space accessible to all, or service for that matter. And it turns out that that can actually 1% increase of the total cost when you make the initial investment. If you don't make that initial investment, retrofit later on, it will can exceed 20% of the total uh, of the total initial investment budget. Therefore, making a clear case of investing early on in accessibility. But of course, accessibility for our constituency is as much about all the tech and all the systems put in place as as much as the attitudes among service staff in public transport, etc. So we have some recent examples from South Africa and Kenya where if the public transport staff see or private transport staff see that you have a lived experience of disability, may it be you sitting a, using a wheelchair or you use a white cane, that they actually can react to you on that, on that point. And that is also something we are working towards changing with partners. So going over to some solutions and innovations because Usually we have a roadmap of how to reach accessible transportation for all. And for me it's about first acknowledging that accessibility is a human right. So it's not all, it shouldn't always be about the cost-benefit analysis, whether you should invest in creating an accessible service and environment at all. It is human right. But of course, as I mentioned, there is also a business case. For me, it's also about the compliance with ISO standards, which no one, actually not everyone knows about, have, uh, not even local and regional governments. So that's also one takeaway. And it's also about actual compliance with natural, uh, national standards on accessibility. Some countries have it, most countries not, but those who have it are not even, like I think it's maybe 60% who are actually trying to comply with them. For some it's just a paper product and we have to start somewhere. It's also about compliance with national building codes uh, in coherent ways to foster also transit-oriented transportation and building spaces with a compact city design. And it, as I said, compliance also with international standards and guidelines. For example, in digital accessibility in an era of smart city, also when it comes to public transport, that more and more services are becoming digitalized to service the customers. And with that said, there is usually a reference, I, I saw that during the Asia-Pacific Urban Forum in Asia-Pacific Future Cities report that there are no standards or guidelines on accessibility and digital accessibility in the area of smart cities. But that is incorrect. There is guidelines. There are wonderful organizations actually help assisting cities and actors to assist digital accessibility in smart cities providing a roadmap for the cities to actually improve accessibility. So we need, really need to share the word 
uh, and spread the word that those models exist and can be usable by all, right? And for me, lastly, as a person living uh, with a lived experience of a visual impairment, something which has been incredibly important for me throughout the years, uh, at least back when I was living in Stockholm in Sweden, is the importance of having accessible applications. Because there are so many applications roll out to support us to navigate in the cities, to orient itself between uh, different uh, hubs in the city, uh, but also for us to have real-time updates um, for the public transport, like times, uh, change of schedules, trans um, platform allocations, etc. So for me, that has been incredibly important to foster my own mobility in a rapidly urbanized uh, world, as of course. But then yet again, these, these applications need to be conforming and complying with international standards on web content accessibility and so on. So we have always have to start somewhere, but for me, it's also about adopting universal design principles in all investments we make, right? As I said before, if we invest early, we will save in, in the end. And lastly, uh, yeah, I think that was actually my last point. But if we, if, we pro, uh, if we proactively invest early, we will save a lot of money. And everyone would benefit because then we can also invest not only in making accessible environments more resilient, but also in many ways foster investments in better quality of life in different sectors. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Hannes, and, and thank you for reminding us, really, that accessibility is a human right. It's not necessarily just about a business or making some money, but it's about providing those services because it's people's right to have access to those services. So thank you for that. Um, it's always good to hear from a wide range of groups, uh, and you always remind us of the importance of having accessibility at the top of the agenda to make sure a person's disabilities can actually get to the public transit that they deserve. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Sharifa, representing young people. And she has some images of challenges and solutions to show us from young people. And I'll pass this on to you. OK, can you hear me? OK. OK, a very good uh, evening to all. I'm Sh Sharifah Nuriza from Malaysia, uh, representing United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth, and uh, also International Youth Centre Malaysia. OK, uh, first and foremost, I want to introduce about UNMGCY uh, a little bit for those who are still new to that. The United Nations uh, Major Group for Children and Youth is the mandated uh, by the General Assembly official, officially and self-organized platform for the young people to engage in UN frameworks. Uh, in the context of the new urban agenda, UNMCY serves as the formal en engagement mechanism for the young people to leading up to the adoption of the new urban agenda and now on its implementation, monitoring and uh, also follow up and review. Okay, as the transport, like you, can, you can see the our slide, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, as the transport is a vital economic, social, and also environmental issue, it is also a key area which have uh, some clear and far-reaching targets, and it is a particular concern for the young rural population, and also uh, without uh, the to do also without educate uh, educate pu affordable public transportation can be, uh, become uh, further marginalised. Uh, we also support the work of SLOCAT uh, network in developing fuller indicators and also targets in, the related, uh, in related to the transport. Okay, uh, I move on for the social area. Okay, making sure that the transport is accessible, uh, like just now uh, our friend said, uh, has, a, has a huge uh, social development issues attached to it. Not only does it uh, allow people to remove themselves from the burden or of isolation, effective transport also has a key benefit for health provision, education, and also employment. And therefore, we are targeting uh, that everyone that has a uh, safe to regular transport system by 2030 by uh, taking indicator of people who live within 30 minute walk of public transport and also people have accessible uh, roads all year around within uh, their reach uh, within reach of their home 
by one, uh, 100 percent and the reduction on uh, road traffic mortality and serious injuries by reduction of 50 percent. Uh, so by this um, I mean key area of social uh, area, I mean key point uh, we can say that uh, we can yeah as a young people we are now having like Uber, Grab car and yeah uh, we can have like kind of a share right I mean couple uh, to go to one place to another. Okay, in terms of economic, the cost of transport is a huge burden for people around the world, especially young people, because you want to move from one uh, uh, one workplace and to another, and then uh, therefore it is very important uh, for us uh, to have like very convenient transport, public transport, especially uh, the train. Uh, I mean the railway and everything, the subway. And the target that we are uh, targeting is 50% of people use public transport uh, and active transport by 2030 uh, by uh, taking indicator that um, people use active transport walking or biking for more than 30 minutes a day. Uh, and we are targeting like 50%. And uh, another indicator is how whole household income spent on tra uh, public transport uh, to be below 5%. Five percent, and uh, this one can be yeah. Just now I said uh, we are, we can use the subway commuter and yeah more commuter and subways in our countries, and for the environmental uh, part, okay. Uh, by personalizing the uh, transport, we can yeah we can reduce the low. I mean we can reduce the um, yeah carbon uh, use from the transportation, and. For the environmental part, uh, we we are encouraging personalized um, motorized vehicles like uh, car, uh, motorcycle, and taxi, and uh, which is uh, which are huge polluter in air quality per kilometer driven, and uh, for climate change, mass transport systems are both more economic. Uh, and better for the environment. Therefore, linking mass public transport uh, gr and greening that transport should be the key. And this one needs a beha behavior change in the community and shifting models of consumption from private to private to shared economics uh, or transport. For example, shared ride and all, and all that. And the third one is um, we are targeting to increase efficiency and reduce dangerous chemicals output. From the transport. Okay, uh, uh, some intervention that I want to highlight. Okay, from the perspective of youth, uh, how to move the next slide. Okay, okay. First is by developing uh, developing the transportation. Okay, um, by having culture and innovation uh, to be merged must take inclusivity of uh, of all groups into consideration. Prior to the urban planning, uh, youth representative must be included in any discussion uh, with the municipality and local government. Uh, for example, in the congested area like Jakarta, Indonesia, like uh, in Bangladesh, so uh, they are now um, taking into consideration to uh, make more railways, more uh, train for the young people and especially for the population there to move from, from uh, one to another place. Uh, and innovation and technology have to be cross-sectional uh, and across intergeneration uh, view, not only to meet the modernization ob objective. Uh, and we also need to think on the resilience issue. Okay, what to expect when we have like climate, climate change, I mean climate issues in our country, how to move from one uh, to another place if we don't, we don't have the safety walkway, for example. Uh, it is very important for us to have uh, that kind of a safety uh, walkway for the residents uh, and we can encourage the youth to be more innovative in creating apps and, and all that. For example, in certain countries, they are now having the bikeway uh, I mean area and then walkway area for the residents to be uh, moving from uh, one place to another. Uh, and also the last one intervention that I want I want to share is um, the challenges of youth in rural area, especially to assess uh, education uh, to uh, to get employed, 
uh, from the cities and all that. So these public transports are very, very important for the uh, communities to move. Uh, because now youth are on the go concept, right? So yeah, uh, transportation, transportation and also mobility is important uh, for the groups. Okay, just to share that, okay, first point and uh, I just want to emphasize again, first is uh, to have developing uh, transportation uh, system. And then, okay, just to get a clear picture for uh, what we have from other countries. And then we, ha we need to have culture and behavior change. For example, if we have the, uh, those campaign like Car Free Day and all that, if we don't change our culture, I mean, our acceptance to new things, we will not go anywhere. So uh, if you don't use the transportation that your country provided, for example, the free buses, the apps and so on, uh, and so on uh, you will not uh, achieve the uh, zero uh, or low carbon uh, transportation in your country. And the last one I want to share is um, to develop Oh, sorry, I can't move the next slide. Okay, the last uh, points that I want to share is um, the importance of smart cities. Okay, when we, uh, when we, what, what do you think about the smart cities? Okay, uh, uh, on the youth perspective, we, we uh, are looking forward to uh, the housing area that nearby to the public transport. For example, the LRT, I mean the MRT, the subway and all that so that we can go uh, to our workplace to get employed uh, easily uh, and we can reach the uh, and nearby nearby area we can we can have the uh, I mean education uh, I mean uh, infrastructure uh, or maybe the health provision uh, center easily uh, so uh, it is very uh, encourage encourage maybe <laughs> maybe from the <laughs> urban planning uh, I mean uh, officials uh, to look into that uh, also. Okay, by that, uh, I thank you and uh, maybe we will continue for the other uh, discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you, Sharifa. Uh, Hannes had to run off to another session, so he wanted me to, to, to say thank you for, for joining us for this presentation, but he had to run off. So just wanted to keep you all posted on that. Sharifa, thank you very much. Uh, and it's great that you're able to go through some of the specific SDGs uh, so the specific issues related to mobility and transport in the Sustainable Development Goals and, and to really couch your presentation in three dimensions of sustainable development. The major group for children and youth is, is always quite good at being technical when it comes to their advocacy and work. So it, it's good to remind us of the importance of those policy points. Uh, and of course reminding us that youth are innovators and can be innovators and they need to take their role as innovators. So there's always a lot that young people can do uh, and it's awesome to have representatives of the major group here to bringing people together around some of these important topics like culture change, behavior change and such. And next we go to Kalpana Viswanath who's going to give us some perspectives from, from women and girls. Floor is yours and if you could just pass her the... Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, one of the hats I wear also is I'm part of the advisory group on gender issues at UN Habitat. And the work that I've been doing is really around, uh, like my two earlier speakers, um, uh, my focus has been on how to mobility, public spaces, urban spaces, and transport more gender friendly, gender inclusive, and uh, safer for women to use. Now, women's experience of the city is really um, uh, shaped by two very important uh, issues. One is their role as caregivers, and secondly, in the issue of these that has been done globally to show mobility <clears throat> and their ability to access opportunities and I want to underscore this 
because uh, fear, fear of violence, uh, has plays a very big to access a city. on their ability to access opportunities for education, for um, uh, employment, as well as for entertainment. Uh, the speaker before me talked about this, that you know, uh, they want spaces which are um, public transport, which is close to their homes and stuff like that. So the one issue we need to de deal with very centrally is how do we make mobility safer for women and for everyone so that we can actually uh, work towards carbon-free cities where people are using less and less of public transport because we do know there are many cities where if women can afford they get off public transport so the implications of this ha have ripple effects even on uh, issues like um, uh, carbon and uh, carbon-free cities the second issue I, I wanted to mention is that men and uh, women travel differently this is something we know uh, Men, male fam uh, mobility pattern is uh, normally uh, uh, going to the workplace in the morning and coming back in the evening and maybe doing a few other things on a weekend and stuff. Women's mobility patterns are, uh, they may go to the work to work in the morning and come back in the evening, but in addition, they will often go and drop their children at school. Uh, they may pick them up in the middle of the day. They may have to go to the market on the way back from work. They would... Um, sometimes have to take elderly people to a clinic and other things. So the mobility, the way that cities have been planned is to say that we need a rush hour. So if you look at um, mobility planning, the num largest number of public transport is available at, in the morning from 7 to 10 and again in the evening. But the truth is uh, people travel throughout the day. And it's, I, I've only talked about women now, but if we look at our cities, we have children and youth. We have the elderly. All our cities are becoming much and more, much, much more older. And what is their mobility pattern? So how do we design mobility which doesn't take uh, the norm? So cities and mobility have been designed with the norm of a male, uh, probably able-bodied, uh, who goes to work in the morning, come back, who is probably heterosexual, has a part wife at home who will look after his work of care. Now, once we unpack that, we recognize how many people are invisibilized in transport planning. And if we want to make transport planning truly inclusive, we need to have the voices of people, like uh, um, the first speaker said, right at the moment of planning and not retrofitting. And I'll just give an example which many women in this room will uh, agree with, is when you get onto a metro or a bus, uh, you'll often find that if you have to hold that pole on the top, it's just a little bit higher than it's comfortable for us. It's actually been designed for a man. It's not been designed, uh, and certainly for women who are not that tall, that's, it's even more difficult. You obviously um, can't even reach it sometimes. So, uh, you know, it's the entire planning needs to be changed. So, uh, uh, this is um, from a, a study that was done. Uh, it is, it's about, I think, ten, uh, seven, eight years old, but it looks at different cities. And I don't want to go into the detail, but the point is women walk and women use public transport a lot, um, uh, the majority. Private transport is much less. In many countries, they don't even cycle because of cultural reasons, because of other reasons, and therefore we need to, we need to strengthen public transport because many women use it. I want to just share an example of the city I come from in Delhi, where recently... Uh, and many of you may have heard of Delhi for actually being quite unsafe for women. The Delhi government recently came up with a scheme where they have made public buses free for women. And this is an interesting scheme because it, it was very controversial. And I think the point that someone made earlier is that public transport is a public good. We do not need to look at everything from the point of view of... Uh, an enterprise where we have to make a profit from. So if we say that education, healthcare are public goods, we have to recognize that public transport is a public good in many ways. And if it is so, we can look at different models. I'm not suggesting it always has to be free, but different models where we keep in mind the need to get more people to use public transport before uh, making money out of it. You know, I think that's something that we need to look at. 
And for women, we know from everybody, uh, as I talked about, we have several levels of um, of the elements of the public transport. And for women, as I talked uh, mentioned earlier, all these points are vulnerable. You face danger while standing at the bus stop, inside the bus, as well as walking back from the bus stop. Uh, last mile transit is something we really need to look at. Uh, we know that very often the bus system, the metro system, the subways work, but how do you get back after that at the last? And this has several elements, you know, the infrastructure there, the social usage, as well as IPT and other elements. And finally, I, um, the two, um, two things I want to mention. One is the whole issue of women-only transport, because very often the response to sexual harassment is to provide women only transport. So one car of the metro. And while, uh, you know, as I would say, this is sometimes a solution that needs to be done as a temporary solution, uh, we must not take that as the moment you've given a private car, a, a one car to women in a metro, you have solved the problem. We have to make all public transport safe for women. We have seen these women only taxis, women only rickshaws, we, have that, we had them in many cities in India, what happened was they never worked. Because at the, at, at the end of the day, if I get out of my office, I, I do not want to wait for that one auto or ta taxi, which would be for women, but I want to get out immediately. So the only solution is to make all public spaces and public transport for women. And if we have women-only uh, solutions, they can and must only be temporary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalpana, and, and thank you for your insights, really. I, it, it's, it's so critical to listen to these stakeholder groups, to representatives of these stakeholders groups, to, to talk to the people who live through these issues on a daily basis, because these are the people for which transport and mobility um, services are really for. These are, these are the people for whom the work that we do in the transport sector are meant to benefit. And it's so important to actually listen to what they have to say, to hear where their issues are, and of course, to know what the solutions they might provide. That's why engaging them in these discussions and this work is so critical. So, so really, thank you for telling us about, about some of the, the really important issues that women face on a daily basis, trying to get to work, trying to, to care for their families, and on and on. So it's really important to have these conversations and, and we appreciate all of your presentations. Now to move on to the next part of segment one of our, of our, of our uh, session, I'd like to invite some people who actually work directly in the transport sector to come to the stage and to talk about some of their experiences, provide some of their solutions um, to some of the accessibility issues that we've been listening to uh, from the people who've already presented. So I'd like to invite Mr. Ramon Cruz from um, ITDP. He's the International Policy Program Director of ITDP. And I'd also like to invite uh, Mr. Chomba Muni, who is the Vice Chair of the National Gender and Equality Commission of Kenya. We were expecting somebody from UN Habitat to present as well, but there were some last minute changes, uh, but I'm sure our two presenters here will do a wonderful job. So, okay, so we're gonna bin begin with Ramon's presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, so, uh, well, I'm Ramon Cruz from uh, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Uh, I actually must say that uh, I wasn't, the, supposed to be the one coming here, it was uh, uh, my colleague Shreya Gadepali from uh, the director of the uh, office, the ITDP office in India, uh, was going to give uh, this presentation. But, uh, but well, uh, last minute changes as, as well. She had to, uh, to stay in India for uh, some government uh, meetings. So. But anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to do my best. Uh, but uh, well, first I wanted to... Uh, the the organizers ask us to bring more uh, visual and uh, and photos etc to to present different problem, uh, problems but uh, so I wanted to uh, to show you this uh, this picture and um, even though this is a silent event uh, please I would like to ask the audience what do you what's wrong with this picture please. I'm sure there's many people that can say, you can shout. What? Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Uh huh. Any other? Not walking space. Exactly. So, um, so yeah. I mean, as 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 all of you have pointed out, and if we go back to the uh, previous panel, basically, um, you know, there's no space for the most vulnerable uh, uh, people in in society. Um, you know, how can a kid go through all those motorcycles while while they're parking, or um, a person with a visual impairment like? go through this uh this would take forever no and it would be a challenge it would be uh scary even no so um so that's why definitely uh when we think of of streets and how we plan our cities our streets uh, there are many things that uh that needs to be taken into consideration first of all uh, what are our priorities? You no, know, for the for the public space for for the public space for the open space. Um, oh, hmm. There is. Uh, oh, okay. Well, that's that's the one uh, one one project that we have uh, that uh, ITDP has worked on. Uh, very clearly uh, shows the same kind of problems. Uh, in uh, in the street, if you take this picture afterwards, mm, where is the where do I have to? Here we go. So uh, so you can see how how this is uh, uh, bringing back the uh, the space to uh, the level of planning that it's supposed to be. That it's uh, having uh, people in mind as the first concern. And then comes the other the other aspects of of mobility that are of course necessary as well. But it's uh, what are uh, what do we prioritize uh, in our planning process? And um, and so now I will go. Oh, point that way. Thank you. <laughs> Pointing over there. Um, <laughs> so um, so then uh, so yes, yeah, so I'll I'll just go through very quickly through some uh, photos that, uh, that basically showed how, these, uh, how many amenities we, we should take into consideration uh, to make cities safer, to make cities also, uh, you know, basically the place where we live, no? And uh, where we want to be, and uh, uh, not only being safe, uh, but also uh, accessible. So, for example, it's the same uh, uh, here, when you plan for a cities for the most vulnerable and for children, uh, you know here you 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 have also another example. You know how uh, scary it is to to go through a street like this. Um, but now you're in between me and the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, when you have safe crossings where you have the the right infrastructure. Um, here, for example, uh, it's a crossing with uh, many aspects that uh, that slows down traffic, uh, that uh, separates the pedestrian, makes it a, a, a safe uh, um, way to uh, to go through the city. You no. Know? Um, the same with uh, greenery. Here, you can see how there's a, a space separating the. Um, the cycle, the bicycle path, uh, with um, from the streets and then also from a pedestrian. And uh, here, for example, if you think about children, the places where where children uh, play, etc. Here you have spaces also for the caregivers to uh, to sit down, to have uh, to have that visual uh, also a contact with uh, with uh, children. Um, so, okay, here is another example. Um, also, then some, uh, you know, when one think of uh, of how to reclaim or how to gain back uh, spaces that are have already for many years uh, taken um, by the by motor vehicles by parking spots. Um, you know the mayor of uh, of Tirana before uh, in a previous panel 
uh, organized by UITP was talking how uh, in many places parking uh, advocates, I guess, if you can call them that, like that, uh, basically think of parking as a human right. And parking is not a human right. Uh, actually, is is the access uh, to the streets to uh, to save an accessible street. What is what is uh, most important? So here you have some aspects of how to restrain, uh, um, you know, that um, motor vehicles. But it's to the advantage then of the pedestrian and making the uh, crossings uh, safer. Um, and I'm about to finish. Hmm. Okay, so here are again more infrastructure and how to, uh, you know, it's relatively uh, easy uh, to create these spaces uh, that are good for, uh, for children to be in, also for the general population. This is basically a, a public gym uh, that people can use at all times. And uh, then again, then you have a activity at night as well, so you can, you can think of, of streets to be uh, all the time then for uh, public transportation then you have also space for it uh, again instead of individual uh, mobility and oh yep and so uh, so this is it uh, I wanted to point out uh, there's some postcards in the back of the access for all series uh, policies for inclusive TOD and we actually have a networking event um, on uh, Tuesday, February 11, 4.30 p.m., uh, Hall 3, Room 16. Uh, also, this series is basically one that ITDP has been uh, co-authoring with different organizations. In this case, you have the logos up there. There's uh, basically uh, one uh, on gender and access that uh, Kalpana had a slide uh, from that report. Uh, but we also have uh, one with uh, Safety Bean on safety issues, uh, one with uh, Bernard Van Leer Foundation on uh, children, and also with World Enabled uh, for people with disabilities. So, and hopefully there will be more to come. So, thank you. Thank you, Ramon. It, it seems like we're always having some technological issues. I feel like this is the story of my life, but we'll fight through it. But we. It, we're really grateful for your support, no matter what. Uh, thanks, and, and it's really great that you brought up this concept of reclaiming streets for people, right? Because for so long, the paradigm has been, well, streets are for cars, streets are for, you know, getting these big boxes, as, they, as someone else said in, an event, in another event, from one place to the other. And in reality, streets are for people to use and, and to play and to exercise. And all these images you were showing us from some of the different cities in which ITDP works, including Pune. Um, so thank you for that presentation. We, we appreciate it. Our next speaker, let me just get to your slides, Dr. Tromba. There we go. Our next speaker is Dr. Tromba Muni, and he's working a lot now with accessibility issues in Kenya. Uh, and he's going to give us some of the solutions and, 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 and projects that have been done um, at local levels in, in the work that he's doing. So thank you very much for joining us. Definitely, I'm not used to silent events. So, and, uh, so you excuse me. Uh, I will allow you if you do not follow as, as teachers will say. Raise up your hands. Some of us will say because I would like to be as clear as a teacher in the classroom. However, having said that, uh, I'm so grateful that uh, I can share with you the Kenyan experience. Kenya is an economic hub with the expanding cities and infrastructure <clears throat> and is uh, therefore in need of an efficient public transport system like many other countries. Persons with disabilities, lactating uh, mothers, pregnant women, young children, the sick and the aged continue to encounter countless barriers to accessible transport in Kenya. It is for this reason that in 2019, 
the National Gender and Equality Commission, the commission that I'm working on, and um, have been there for quite some time, has been working with UN Habitat and uh, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, ITP. This commenced, we commenced a program of engaging persons in vulnerable situations to identify challenges they face in um, transportation, provide solutions, and inform content of a legislative and a policy framework on inclusive urban transport. We shall demonstrate that our experiences using the, the videos that you see. The pilot project had a, a budget of 1.2 million only US dollars. And now slide one will show you, or as you can see, shows some of the most common barriers to accessible transport in Kenya that persons with disabilities face. They include A, inaccessible pedestrian overhead bar bridges due to um, staircases, which are really <laughs> sometimes extremely difficult for us. Um, narrow roads that leave no space for mobility of persons in vulnerable situations. And in, in, in um, Vision 1, in uh, Video 1, for example, you can imagine a staircase with somebody on a wheelchair. This, this is unimaginable. Difficulties in crossing highway guardrails because no safe spaces are created for crossing. That's a nightmare. Now, turning to slide two, this will show you consultations amongst persons with disabilities with uh, support from staff of the organization work for, National Gender and Equality Commission, UN Habitat. We've done all that to, con to identify solutions and uh, develop statements for presentations to duty bearers. I dare say at this point that it is critical to involve vulnerable groups when you are discussing inclusive transport because these days we no longer imagine problems for them. We discuss, we brainstorm, and we have learned a lot from consultative discussions, not only with um, development partners but also with persons in vulnerable situations themselves. Slide, the slide shows um, parliamentarians, as you can see, with disabilities, joining other persons with disabilities in a street march to educate the public about transportation needs for persons with disabilities. Now, why, 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 why educate the public? There are so many negative and negative perceptions and attitudes towards persons with disabilities. And our experience in Kenya, I must tell you, that most of persons with vulnerable situations, in vulnerable situations, particularly the elderly and PWDs, who would be very useful and who would be used to generate income, remain at home, as a speaker said, people fear transport. In, because it's not inclusive. In fact, the worst would be it is discriminative. That has been our experience when it comes to people living in vulnerable situations. Slide three shows the progress that pilot project has resulted in a per period of 12 months. The first one is that um, the National Transport Authority of Kenya, NTSA, has traffic marshals in most of the pedestrian uh, crossing points to assist pedestrians, including children, to cross the roads. Some of the people even have volunteers. They volunteer to help us in this. Secondly, 
institutions of learning for children with special needs have taken the lead in using adjusted buses, a practice to be replicated in all other institutions. Third, the government of Kenya has increased number of public education sessions about inclusive urban transport to influence positive attitudes towards persons with disabilities. Some public transport vehicles mistreat persons with disabilities and a lot of public education is required. Now, how, is, how does that happen? Sometimes when you're waiting for a vehicle because they think you'll take time with your wheelchair to get on, the, to, on board, they just leave you or else. My experience has been they make sure that they stop at a distance so that others, because of need of transport in Kenya, will have to run and catch you. You will not be able to run. As a person, a blind person, you'll be left. And nobody wants to hold hands with you. And um, so that we don't have uh, special seats for this kind of people. Others believe, and that's why we're educating them. People with disabilities do not have money. They are poor. You know, that's a generalization, which is very dangerous. So that generalization has hurt us. Others will carry you. They will give you the lift. I mean, will allow you to board, but leave you in a situation where in a, in a bus of which is not known. They will pass what to. You tell them, stop me there. Let me alight at such and such a place. They will not put you there. So they will leave you in a confused place. That is why we are changing the attitude. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the capital city of Nairobi has installed several digital zebra crossings. That is a plus. And therefore, to conclude, I would like to say this. Persons in vulnerable situations, including persons with disabilities, have a role to play in the development of legislative and the policy framework, as well as innovations for inclusive transport. Needless to say, we must domesticate in every country the CRPD, Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities. We shall go a long way. If we can get stakeholders and people interested in inclusive transport to assist in this so that every country complies with CRPD. Programs must therefore provide these populations with opportunities to express themselves and contribute to the development of inclusive urban transport. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Chamba. It's really good to hear your insights because you're really proving the point that we're trying to make is that without these partnerships, there can be no proper accessibility for persons in vulnerable situations. And the work that you're doing in Kenya is helping to spur these partnerships, to help them grow, and to actually lead to some good outcomes that can help people access mobility in cities. So really, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Okay, so next up on our agenda, we're gonna have a, a reflection um, by somebody from within the sustainable low carbon transport sector. We have the Secretary General of UITP, the International Association of Public Transportation, Mr. Mohammed Merzani. He's going to give us some of his thoughts, his views, talk about some of the work that, he's, that his organization is doing, and kind of give us a nice little segue into our next segment in our networking event. So please join us on stage, Mohammed. So thank you very much. Uh, it was really very, <clears throat> very interesting, very rich uh, discussion and session presentation made. And the last uh, presentation made by the gentleman from Kenya made me uh, think about uh, when I was a child in Tunisia and uh, I used to go work from home to school and uh, each time I had to uh, stop by uh, one of the uh, shops there and ask the shopkeepers to help me cross the road. Uh, because otherwise it would, uh, of course, there are no pedestrian uh, 
you know, zebra crossing. And anyway, even if there is one, it won't be respected. And and so, yeah, uh, it was uh, it was really a, a challenge every time I, I used to go to school. Now the situation is improving, luckily. Um, so. Thank you for all the information shared and the uh, experience shared by, by the different speakers, many examples from many countries, so I, I learned a lot, I learned a lot, and, uh, and I would like to, to, to thank the speakers and those who defined the session, of course. Uh, first, just try to learn some, or let's say draw some lessons or some messages from what I, uh, uh, I heard. Uh, first, that mobility is not just about moving from A to B, it's about making an impact on people's life. Uh, people, if they move, it's because they want to access jobs, they want to access education, they want to access their family, entertainment, etc., etc. And so this is important that when we, we design transport system, we have this in mind. Is we are not just designing a, a, yeah, a, a, a transport or a connection. It's, it's about uh, helping people to, to, to organize their life and to live in the, in the city. And in this context, the good thing about public transport is that it carries everyone. It carries the youth and the old elderly people, the, uh, the, the pupils and the business uh, person. Uh, I was about to say businessmen, you see how... <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, the, 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 the girls and the boys, so really the rich and the poor. And, and this is the good thing about public transport, it's that it reflects the society. But it means that it has to be defined also by those who are using it. And, and, and I would say uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, public transport or mobility is too important to leave it to men exclusively. And unfortunately, this is uh, what uh, uh, is the case in, in, in many of the, of the cities. So we need to involve every constituency in its design and its operation. Uh, one example. Uh, that I mentioned in the previous session, but I would like to repeat it. Uh, there are uh, more women traveling or using public transport than men, in average, in the world. But there are only 17% of the workforce in public transport uh, are, uh, are, is composed of women, only 17%. So if, if we don't have women working in public transport, then it will be designed by a majority of men and then considering or taking into account the expectations of, of, of men primarily. So it's important and we, we, we even realized in some companies when we have women uh, participating in uh, recruitment panels, they also tend to recruit more women. Uh, so it's, it's, it's important that we, 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 we give this, uh, this uh, uh, possibility to access jobs to, uh, to women. Uh, and actually, it's a logic in, in all other, if, if it is in, in a commercial, in business sector, you will see that the first thing we will do is to try to assess or to know the expectations of the customers and to define the product according to what the, uh, the, uh, the customers expect. So we have to do that in public transport too. Uh, we have to really move from a supply-led uh, uh, sector to a demand-responsive uh, demand, uh, 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 or, or proactive uh, sector. So, and what is good also about that is it will, it's not only, it's, of course, it's a human right and it will, uh, let's say, uh, satisfy this human right, but it will, will be good for business too. I mean, if you are more customer oriented and more uh, taking into account more the expectations of your of your travelers, of uh, the people using public transport, it will be better for, for the business as well. So, and I like what was proposed by the first speaker, Hannes. He said we should adopt an universal design, adopt universal design principles. And this is what we do for safety, for example. We don't, I mean, for when we design vehicles, when we de design a service, we consider these safety principles in the design. So we have to consider also the specific needs of the different categories of the of the of the uh, of the population uh, in in the design of our transport system. And also, I I like also uh, what uh, sorry I forgot your first name. 
Kalpana, thank you. Uh, what you said about no segregation between the different categories of users, or between women and the rest, and, 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 and men. Uh, so segregation could be at, at on, on a temporary basis just to, to help def better define the service and, and, the, and the deploy the, 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 inf the, the network, but it should not be uh, uh, installed into uh, into the public transport uh, system and at the end if it is good for women if it is good for disabled person or if it is good for any specific uh, uh, category of the population it will be good for all so uh, uh, we are not going to let's say impact men by uh, having the system uh, good for women so uh, at the contrary it will be even better for for men so in uh, in UITP we uh, we, we gather the whole ecosystem, actually. So UITP, the Public Transport Association for all public transport stakeholders, operators, authorities, supplying industry, etc. And as you can imagine, this kind of, of topics could be a challenge because when we speak about adopting the, ad, uh, uh, adapting the system to different categories of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the travelers, some of them will say, yes, but who will have to pay for that? Uh, why shall I pay for that? The authority should pay for that, etc. So, and the way we try to discuss about that is really to make them think about about people in general, not to make, not to approach it from a, from a, let's say a business perspective, but to approach it from a, a, a people a people's uh, perspective. And this is the way we can we can make them share the same objective. And thanks to that, uh, I would like to mention three examples on the three different uh, three different. Uh, 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 categories of, uh, of, of people that we, we have been discussing in this session. For example, for the disabled people or uh, people with disabilities, we have uh, uh, published recently a, a study that we carried out with uh, Handicap International on the accessibility of a public transport uh, system. Also, we are working with the World Blind Union uh, on autonomous vehicles. And you know, it was mentioned earlier that there are 253 million uh, blind or short-sighted uh, persons in the world and they consider autonomous vehicles as an opportunity because they 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 can move without having a driver or without uh, of course they cannot drive and they can move without having a driver so we are we are studying the if uh, the the impact of autonomous vehicles on the mobility of uh, blind uh, people regarding youth we have a foundation called youth for public transport and we are working with the young people uh, on on, 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 on uh, involving them in developing uh, applications, in developing uh, products uh, for which will make the the, the, the travel of uh, young people uh, uh, more convenient, but also which will uh, involving young people in defining public transport services. Uh, that's important. Encouraging the youth to work in public transport. And the, the last initiative is about women, and we have an initiative called PT for Me, uh, we, where we. We, we, we study two facets. First, women as uh, uh, travelers, and especially for the safety uh, issue uh, uh, of women, uh, and uh, also women as uh, employ employees of public transport, as leaders in public transport, as managers of public transport, and, and how they can uh, influence and they can uh, have an impact on the definition of public transport systems. So thank you very much, and uh, really thank you for uh, uh, making this session rich and, and uh, informative for all of us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mohammed. That was a perfect summary, summary I think, of, of the panelists and of all the discussions that we're having up here. Um, it's really good to hear your insights um, and to kind of tie it all together as we prepare for more interactivity now uh, with our audience, our participants, and our presenters who are on stage. So I'd like to call back Sharifa and Kalpana. We're gonna have some time now for a quick Q&A with all of you. So you have a chance now to ask our, audi our panelists about some of the things they talked about. If you have any questions or comments, we wanna open the floor to all of you. So we have our colleague here, Shivam, going around with the mic. So please remember to speak into the mic so everybody can hear. Um, we have a speaker back there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Peter from Ghana, and also live in Nairobi, and also um, a member of the GAP um, PCG, um, 
persons with disability group. Um, I've listened to the challenges and number of things that we are facing when it comes to transport. And uh, whether we like it or not, currently there are a number of um, vehicles in the system in, um, in Kenya, for instance, Nairobi, when my brother mentioned, and a number of challenges. There are a number of vehicles, and to get them out for now will be um, very difficult unless there's uh, strong measures in place to make sure the next vehicles that we import into the country are very accessible. So I have these, uh, I'm, I've been thinking about immediate um, uh, maybe measures that we can also sensitize the transport sector to also start. For instance, um, when um, in Nairobi or in Ghana and most of the African countries, um, the vehicles does not have a sign to show you that you are getting to the next stop. So if you don't know where you are going, you just sit there and then maybe your, the next passenger may not be able to tell you where we are, you are. So I think the conductors need to mention um, every stage before they get there, needs to make it clear that we are getting to the next stage. So that if you are a visually impaired person, you get prepared and know where you are. And then they can also write maybe on a paper for the meantime to show on, uh, the, towards the passengers so that if your person with, uh, who is deaf will be able to know this is the next stage that I'm getting to. Um, that will also help the, the situation for us to uh, get accessible um, transport. And the, the <coughs> roads, in fact, using wheelchair is a nightmare. So what we need to do, I think we, uh, government, you know, there's, there's the need for redesigning of our roads in Africa, and uh, for instance, Nairobi, so that we may have um, a place that if you are using a wheelchair, you'll be able to uh, uh, use it. But for the parliamentarians to go on demonstration, they are the ones who make laws. They can make strong laws and make sure government implement those laws in order for all of us to enjoy um, a transport that we want. Thank you very much. Over here, we have a question. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Evans. I, I'm a lecturer at the Regional Maritime University in Ghana. Um, well, it seems that most of the things that we've talked about here has to do with government implementation. Uh, for, for, for Ghana like this, our public transport system is basically in the hands of the private sector. Okay, so we have the, the Ghana Private Transport Union um, that basically operates public transport. Okay, now, we need to involve them Okay, there is a basic reason why the BRT system in Accra has failed, and it's because we never involved the owners of the public transport buses. Now we can do all the talking, but then the implementation goes down to the private sector. Because if I have a bus, and um, I have a driver or I have a conductor, I wouldn't be too enthused about providing people with uh, with disability some space in my bus, it, it, it wouldn't be my problem. It would be a problem of government. So my point here is that we need to involve the private sector so much. Not just in Ghana, but in many of the African cities, public transport is in the hands of the private sector. So the government can do whatever we want to do, but they wouldn't really care about it. So please, uh, in doing our report, in doing our part of implementation, Let's involve the private sector because they are very, very strong. Now, when you come to Accra, there is a very famous uh, bus terminal called Tema Station in Accra within the AMB station. Now, when it was built, I remember I was a little boy. I come from Accra. I come from Swalaba. When it was built, it was purposely for 
for a bus station. Now, when you go there, market women have taken over the station and the buses park outside. And it is because of political will. And it is because the buses belong to the private people. It is not for government. So they also want to find their livelihood. Okay, so in trying to implement this, I think we should involve the private sector. If we don't do it, especially for second world countries like ours, this whole system is going to fail. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to reorganize a bit what we had planned for this session because we want to do some group discussions, but we realize the room is a bit, it's not really great for that kind of networking, even though it is technically a networking event, but the room's not really set up for networking. Um, and since there's a, kind of a small group already here, we figured we can just integrate the Q&A with what we had planned for segment two. And your two comments have really, I think, kicked us off a bit. What we had planned to do was to kind of continue this conversation around challenges and solutions. Um, so we had prepared some guiding questions, and I'll read them out for you in case you can't see or hear them. Um, but some of these guiding questions were, what are the unique transport and mobility challenges in your cities or towns? What are some locally crafted solutions to these challenges? And how can the sustainable low carbon transport sector better engage your community? So these are some of the guiding questions we came up with. And we're going to continue this Q&A with all of you here. And then we'll allow the panel, I think, to, to reflect on some of the comments that were made, some of the questions. And then we could close it off from there. So this is a nice way to really continue this interaction um, without necessarily rearranging the room for the next event. So thank you for your comments. Uh, let's continue this. So anybody else has any comments or questions? Okay, Shivam. <laughs> I have a question myself, since I already have the mic. <laughs> it's very similar to the last gentleman's question, which was a great one. Um, I was born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, so I also know what it is like to take a matatu or a minivan across the city. And it, it comes to me as no surprise that someone with a disability could not access that. <laughs> so I wonder, as people here who can advocate for policy or actually make policies, how do we make a privately owned minivan change the way they operate. It's not publicly owned where you can set the laws and you can make force them to change. How do you make a privately owned Matatu become more inclusive? So there's our first question from, from our audience. How do you make a privately owned transit vehicle that is meant to serve the public um, more accessible, better in terms of accessibility and service? That's our first question. Does anyone else have any more questions for our panel? Okay, I pass it to you now. Maybe as, they, as we continue this conversation, we'll whet your appetites to ask some more questions. Um, but I'd like to give the floor now to maybe Dr. Chamba to answer this question from, from Shivam. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, take this. Thank you. Yeah. You see, that's not a simple question because uh, the private sector is about making money. But um, they are they're interested in profit making. And the attitudes that they have towards persons with disabilities is that uh, uh, probably even if, and this we have to educate them, even if they modernized uh, or modified their vehicles, because that is what we need to encourage them to do and, and give them compensation for that, they still believe that probably they will not get many passengers to do that, to, to make money. But all the same, I think, uh, in Kenya we realize that um, most of our transport system is highly, unfortunately, commercialized. It's not in the hands of the government. And so what we have been doing, like I said, we have been holding uh, public education for conductors. And this time we are discussing with the National Transport Security Authority, Safety Authority, we, we, we would like them to organize uh, training seminars where we could have um, the conductors trained in this. And at the, at the same time, we are persuading them to come up with um, policies, transport policies, that even the matatos would like to buy because we want them to be on board. Oh, sorry, when I say matatos, those are minibuses, you know, commercial transport. 
Uh, yeah, we, 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 want, we want to make sure that we, we involve stakeholders uh, in discussions that, 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 that will come up with a solution. Be that as it, as it may, in Kenya today, somebody has mentioned about BRT. We are, our, we are even encouraging uh, the private sector to uh, buy this, uh, modify these buses, uh, and then the government will compensate them for a certain percentage which they will incur in modifying these vehicles. Surely that's what I can say. Thank you very much, Dr. Chombo. So now we kind of had two okay. comments. Oh, you want Sure, go I, ahead. I mean, it's just uh, also because, uh, especially the, the uh, comment on the private sector, uh, you know, because uh, I think that while, you know, the government, uh, you could argue, you know, are, are um, want to make sure, ensure that, uh, that everybody reach its uh, potential, uh, maximum potential in society, including the private sector. Uh, which you know, it's not only provide some services, but also make profit, etc. Uh, governments also have the responsibility to uh, to ensure that uh, that everybody, uh, you know, not only the private sector can can reach that potential. So, so in many places, for example, the different routes, corridors, etc., are uh, operate by concession, uh, and. Uh, Every number of years, these are negotiated, these are awarded, etc., and uh, and many places uh, can actually uh, do have regulations or requirements to enter in a in a specific market. You have to cover certain uh, uh, you know uh, amenities, responsibilities, etc. How many of you, for example, in your country, uh, using seat belts uh, are actually a requirement or law? You know, because it's 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 part of it's it's the law to wear that. No, so so in the same way that even though that's the government, you could argue messing up with uh, some private uh, or individual responsibility. They know that it's important, and that if not, there will be other other costs for society. So in similar ways, the government uh, governments can regulate uh, that kind of uh, of requirement for the private sector as well. No, I think this is a very central question because in many um, cities in developing countries, um, a lot of the p transport is private, right? And we know it's not going to change immediately. It's not going to change soon, and so it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's a little idealist to say all of it should be public, publicly owned. So in the meanwhile, you know, in in that in, in while we are sort of maybe working towards better public transport. I think one of the things that, like Ramon said, is that the, the government can regulate it. I mean, at this point, many governments choose not to regulate it, you know, for many reasons. Because in many of our countries, the government is also making money from this, from these private operators. So we do know that corruption is a problem in many of our countries. And therefore, we have to look at even dealing with issues like that. Um, like for example, if I say in in Delhi, right, we have um, we have a very good government regulated public transport system, but we have many many private uh, solutions, especially for last mile connectivity, right. So we have a metro which is excellent. We have a, a bus transport system, but we have, I think, a whole load of other things, you know, which are, you know, especially in the far flung parts of the city. And these are not have were not regulated at all. And over the past ten years, with a lot of pressure from civil society, we are finding that we can push governments to regulate it, because we know, for example, as women, that unregulated public transport, if sexual harassment takes place, there's nothing you can do. And very often, the driver and the conductor are all part of the system. So I think um, that's one. The second thing um, I think one of you mentioned is that. You know, engage them as stakeholders. So even build their capacity to understand some of these issues. And we don't have to presume that all private sector is not at all bothered about this, you know. So maybe it's just never been sort of something that's in their horizon. So if you bring in the issue of, for example, we've had training, capacity building workshops with 
all kinds of, we have public drivers, but even Uber drivers, we've done gender sensitization training, to say, what is it that, what is it about your behavior that makes women feel uncomfortable, right? So some of it can be negotiated. So I think we can uh, work, you know, on the more formal systems, regulation, but also capacity building and bringing them as stakeholders around the table to address it in a common way. Thank you very much, Kalpana. Mohammed? Thank you. Uh, I think we, we, should, uh, we should not uh, try to oppose private to, to, to public. I think, I, I think the operator, if, if the transport operator is a private or, or public, uh, the, the rule should be the, sa the, the same for everyone. Uh, we have examples where the publicly owned transport companies are performing very well and they have very good, uh, uh, let's say, safety records. And we have examples also when privately uh, owned companies also they are performing very well. And, 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 and so what is important, I think, is that we have a public authority regulating and that the rules are applied to, to and enforced for, 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 for everyone. That we have also a public transport authority that is covering all, all, all modes, all collective modes and shared modes. The problem we have here is that often we have in cities uh, metros or buses that are uh, governed by public transport authority but then the on-demand modes are not uh, uh, in the same framework and so that's why there are some some issues and this is not uh, acceptable we need to really to have uh, all of them uh, under the same under the same umbrella under the same uh, the same regulation because uh, they all carry the same people so why when i travel with a taxi i am uh, uh, subject to a certain regulatory framework, but if I travel with a bus, I am subject with another one, and if I travel with Uber, it will be a, dif a different one. It, it, it's not logic. Since it's the same person traveling in the same mobility market, the rule should be the same for, 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 for all. And, and, and if we succeed to do that, and there are examples where they... Where they uh, we have one example here, Dubai, which is not far from here, where we have a public transport, a transport authority uh, in charge of all modes of transport, uh, including freight distribution. So when you have this kind of integrated authority, you, 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 won't, ha you won't have any more this, uh, the problem of uh, public versus private. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions or comments from anybody in the audience? Oh. <laughs> We have one from M.A. over here. <laughs> Hi, um, I wanted to ask a question because this was raised a couple of times by people um, on the panel about behavior change and if we're talking about making places safer for women or making uh, people use sustainable transport uh, more often and, and that's their mode of choice, how are we thinking about behavior change in terms of the things that we need to be bringing into this discussion? Should we bring some questions together and then we can throw it to the panel, so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dionisio Gonzalez from uh, UITP. Uh, I, I like it very much the presentation by, by Ramon uh, because most of the discussions we are having with uh, uh, local decision makers during this booth has to do with the uh, walkability of our cities, yeah? which is super, super relevant. Yeah? Uh, I, I would like to, to uh, I mean, to give some attention to this, to this, uh, to this point. To what extent should we try to um, develop these capacities, to develop this this uh, knowledge into local decision makers? Because there are a lot of secondary cities. All the big metropolitan areas are relatively well served. We are putting a lot of attention and a lot of effort on these big metropolitan areas, but uh, more and more secondary cities are, are developing. Uh, particularly here in in, in, in uh, uh, this part of the, of the world, yeah. So shouldn't we shouldn't we develop something particularly for these secondary cities? And are no uh, are UITP ITDP is at well placed for that uh, together with with all these local decision makers? Thank you. Thank you, Dionisio. And another question here. Did someone have their hand up? So you first. <laughs> uh, hi, Jakub Gauszka. Um, a question, maybe a comment more. 
uh, in regards to the discussion on, on regulation and potentially having one institution which overlooks the public sector and private sector, I think it's remember it's important to remember that public sector is very often subsidized and private sector is not and that's why it's simply easy to uh, enforce something in a in a in a situation of of uh, financial support and perhaps perhaps a, a way of including uh, including uh, innovative financial systems and integrating private private sector into into new financial solutions could be could be interesting in fraud, but maybe not to that. So that could be also a question. We'll take one more, and then I'll throw it back to all of you to take a crack at those very interesting questions. Thank you very much, Shivan. My question is about the money. So we're talking about uh, making transport and mobility for people. Uh, we're talking about regulatory frameworks. We're talking about mixing the informal with the formal. Um, what is the reality out there about financing all this and financing this type of mobility and transportation in cities, whether big capitals, whether rural urban connectivity, whether secondary cities? Are the financiers getting it? Do we have to say anything to our international financial institutions or to the national development banks to make sure that these realities are actually translated into bankable projects and they actually see the need for those type of projects? Is there anything the panel would like to tell us about that? Thank you. Last question, take it away. <laughs> yeah, just one more uh, point I want to make. It's quite similar to what Amey just said about social change and how do we get citizens within those cities to actually change the decisions they make. And when I look at the panelists, I know Kalpana, for example, with Safety Pin, she offers a platform, being her app, which allows women to have a voice in areas that they feel safe, unsafe, and what needs to change. So the question is, how do we make citizens of those cities change their behavior? Okay, so here are some challenging questions posed to you all. So I'm going to open the floor to you now. Whoever wants to take a first stab at some of these questions. Okay, Sharifa. Um, okay, I, I think I will take uh, the question on the behavior change. Um, uh, as I, I, I tell you just now, because uh, I think uh, it is applied to any countries, I think. Because if we have something, for example, the free buses, I take uh, exa an example in my country. Uh, in Kuala Lumpur, it is uh, the main city of Malaysia. Uh, the government now uh, providing the free bus for the, I mean, uh, for everyone to use. But then, uh, it is become the privilege of the outsiders, especially from the, I mean, uh, from the for the for the foreigners to use it. It is actually free for the uh, the main citizen, but it is used by the, uh, I mean, foreigners from the other countries. So it is um, more to the mentality because sometimes we are given the free things, but we are neglect. I mean, we are neglecting it and we are, I mean, avoiding it. Why? So it one is more to mentality change first, and then uh, towards the behavior change. And then the second one is uh, about uh, car free day. Sometimes uh, in some countries we uh, providing that campaign to uh, to be like pre car free day, but not many people will join it. Why? Again, mentality and acceptance of the culture changes that uh, uh, I mean, some uh, groups want to uh, make. And uh, another one is uh, I want to talk about the uh, MRT. Okay, actually, um, MRT. You know uh, the mass rapid transit. Okay, um, maybe in some cities, uh, more uh, many cities having it, and uh, it is like uh, actually. Uh, in Malaysia, uh, MRT have been reducing uh, 160,000 cars coming into the cities like every day. I mean, uh, cars is reducing uh, coming into the cities, uh, and it is very helpful for the people uh, from the others, uh, I mean, far far cities to come to the cities, main cities to work. So it is uh, back to the acceptance of the communities to use it or not. So I think I think that's the point uh, and campaign is very important education is very important uh, to educate the public to use the public transport that provided in the countries and then uh, yeah again uh, I, I want to back to the question just now about the uh, I mean uh, gender gender uh, perspective uh, in Malaysia we already started to have a woman coach for the women to use 
uh, in the MRT. Uh, uh, it is referring to the safety and everything. But then again, um, the communities did not accept it uh, and still use the women coach. I mean, the men still use the women coach and uh, neglecting the I mean the campaign. So I think back to that edu uh, uh, education from the for the community is important and yeah awareness is important. Thank you, Sharifa. Okay, I can take a stab at um, I think two issues. One is the one on financing, which you brought it and you said, and um, you're absolutely right. You know there there is that um, big thing of subsidy. But I, I, I come back to the point I made. I think that we have to look at public transport as a public good. And therefore, maybe even private players need to be given subsidy. Maybe development banks need to put more into it. Because we know that today what is at stake if we do not improve public transport is our whole planet. I mean, it's not, we are in an emergency mode, you know. So I don't think that we should we can continue as business as usual and and link to that is the behavior part of it because we have built cities for cars we have for the past how many decades focused on the car user and aspiration is getting a car now how do we change that it's like it's not just a behavior change it's something much bigger we're looking at you know and i think that uh, we have to recognize, I, mean, I really feel we have to recognize that this is a really serious problem. And we're saying by in the next 10 years, we're going to be 60% urban. And we have, you know, in India, we have now, what, I think, 50 cities which have more than a million population. So your tier two cities, your upcoming cities are, they're growing. And unless we find solutions, everyone is following a model which we know doesn't work. So I think that, um, I think we need to really uh, think fast on our feet in terms of how do we improve public transport, how do we find the finance for it. We have to find the money. And I think many of you sitting around in this room <laughs> have to do that role, have to take on that role. I mean, SLOCAT, UITP, ITDP, other organizations, uh, and city governments, of course. Uh, and for me, then the behavior change is a—it's not a—it's not a small thing. It's a very big thing we're asking. We're asking for a complete change, and therefore, for that, what needs to be done? You know, whether it's finance, looking at um, uh, public transport as a public good, addressing the fact that unless you improve safety, you, people will not use public transport. So you address the root causes of the problem and then create the campaign, a campaign in a vacuum. It's not like just putting on a seat belt. This is much different. You're saying, give up your car, give up the, uh, your parking, remove, then you have to provide the alternate, which is really safe, efficient, cheap, and um, accessible to everybody. Mohammed, you want to make a, a comment? Thank you. Yes, I would like to make a, a comment on the uh, the question about subsidies and uh, what was said ju just now. Uh, I think if, uh, I don't like the word subsidy actually. Uh, why, is, it is not subsidized because it's badly managed. It is compensated actually, because if you have an authority which is imposing the roads, imposing the tariffs, imposing the stops, imposing the, the timetable, you need, you need to be compensated because you don't choose uh, uh, why private uh, operators uh, are more, let's say, uh, uh, um, fine, um, profitable, I would say, because they select the routes they want to operate. They, 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 uh, uh, they, will, uh, uh, they will not operate in a low density areas where the demand is very low, but public companies, we import them to go there in these in this low density areas for the public service dimension, and they have I agree, they should go, they must go there, because we need to serve everyone. This is the definition of public transport. This is the definition of the public service obligation. So it's important that we, we have a public, uh, net, public transport network which uh, serves the whole, the whole uh, city. Uh, and in many countries, 
public transport is operated by private companies which are compensated for for the for the operation because we impose we impose the the tariff and the routes etc etc to them so so yeah again i think the the discussion about public versus private uh what's important is to have a public a public regulator i would say but then the operators could be public or private and 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 also uh, since we we mentioned the uh, behavioral changes and uh, and also the question uh, raised by Marusha about the financing and uh, <coughs> we should uh, we should try also to uh, take the money from those who are creating the problems the cars huh? the the polluter pay principles the congestion charging uh, uh, principle uh, so this is where we can find the money to fund those who are creating more benefits to the to, to the city those who are working those who are biking those who are taking public transport so that's the way we can we can uh, uh, in this case cross subsidize i would say uh, from one mode to the to the other mode thank you thank you ramon um, yes um, well i i would add a few more thoughts on the on the subsidies and the finance part uh, while there's no, like, of course, consensus and every country is different, I think uh, one aspect uh, that, you know, yeah, people think that the public sector is subsidized, but the, the private sector also gets uh, uh, things that are not necessarily directly subsidized, but, for example, fuels are uh, highly subsidized in, in many countries. Uh, also, the infrastructure uh, to operate. So, in that way, also... I mean, this may sound like a bit more philosophical, but as a society, often we subsidize the rich when we're providing, you know, roads, etc., for private usage. But then we pretend that the that the poor actually have to uh, uh, pay for uh, for that, for uh, for the service, for uh, for uh, public transportation, etc. So, uh, so you know, in the, the priorities are kind of uh, switched. Uh, to uh, to something that that should be the opposite way, and and also there's no uh, I don't have to apologize. I mean sometimes subsidies is looked at. I don't like the word either because it has a bad connotation, and uh, and yeah, it's compensation is good or just uh, you know leveling you know society. Uh, you know so those things are are necessary for for governments to take into consideration. Um, you know, the other part that I wanted to say on the financial institutions um, is that uh, that also the, the priorities are, are often mixed. In, in many of the banks, financial institutions, multilateral uh, development banks, etc., the people that uh, go up in the, scale, in, the, in the hierarchy are the people that uh, can take, uh, can manage more money, that can finance bigger projects. And in the case of transport, I, I would say uh, it's the opposite. It should be the opposite. The people that go uh, higher should be the ones that are saving uh, that that are saving uh, trips, that are basically or reducing emissions. Because ultimately, what we would like is infrastructure that would be better, that would deal with climate change, that would be would. Uh, uh, have more access for people instead of uh, building, say, highway projects or uh, a more expensive uh, infrastructure. So, so that in itself, I think it's it's a problem with the way that we measure success and and finance. No, uh, but because the essential you were mentioning how um, uh, the projects, you know, how expensive they are, and actually the ones that I showed in my presentation are very inexpensive when you put it in the big scheme of things uh, and, and what we're uh, spending in infrastructure. There's so much that could be done if you are just uh, uh, being very uh, punctual in terms of your interventions, in terms of uh, making a city much more walkable. Uh, you can do much with relatively uh, much cheaper, certainly with the budgets that, uh, you know, a new highway or an elevated highway or something like that cost, you can do so much more with uh, road safety and accessibility, like the ones that I showed in the in the pictures. Yes. 
Dr. Chomba? Yeah. Well, um, I have listened very intensively, intensively, but um, I want to say that uh, the problem we are solving about money is it's not easy. I cannot say it is gradual. But I think even as we sensitize the general public, one of our best clients that we need to sensitize and to make sure he or she is committed is the government. I think our government must be brought to bear and understand that uh, inclusive transport for people with mobility problems is critical and it's important. In my country, we encourage, as we have all said, compensation and uh, regulations and so on. Uh, but I think when I listen and I talk to people in the private sector, they are very attracted to duty waiver. You know, a bit of uh, waiving the duty to a certain, by a certain percentage. That really encourages by a certain percentage. Like we are now saying that um, we can go up to 30% uh, for BRT, this BRT uh, policy we, we are coming up with. I think it is important to come up with laws like we are suggesting and the policies that, that, that can be realistic over some time so that this problem can be sorted out gradually. So long as we, the government is committed to accessible transport, in coming up with every year, I, I listen to, in my country, to find out, to hear whether there's any budget set aside for transport. We have a ministry for transport and housing. But when we question and interrogate the budget, the amount of money that has been allocated to transport is almost negligible or not available, not at all. It's not there. So I think the government themselves must be committed to inclusive transport. That is matters. Thank you very much, Dr. Chamba. Some of you in your conversations and your presentations have talked a bit about a major challenge that I think all of us face, and that's data. Um, and talking about vulnerable persons, persons in, in special situations when it comes to accessibility, um, we don't really have too much information, really, that can help us understand better how to use that data, especially when it comes to informal transport. So I want to open it up to all of you. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the solutions? How can cities better access data that can help them craft ways of dealing with some of the problems that we've been talking about here? So come, tell us what you think. Ten minutes to talk data. <laughs> Anybody from up here? Maybe some of us are shy, but I don't think so. I will repeat for you, Ramon. The question was about informal transport and data, and how can we maybe help cities better access that, trans that, that data, that information? It's a tough one. <laughs> Kalpana, did you want to take a? No, no, no. No, I think um, uh, one of the, yeah, one of the, um, uh, as uh, Shiva mentioned, one of the, the things that I do is actually we have an app called Safety Pin, and uh, it is, uh, what we do is that we use that to get users in cities to tell us which parts of the cities they feel safe or unsafe. And I think um, in terms of uh, or, or what is the le level of infrastructure. And of, re of late, we've started doing a lot of work around both walkability and last mile connectivity because these two things are very much related to being able to use the streets. And if we want to use the streets, we need to um, understand. So I think what I'm saying about data is that we should, we can access many different data sets. You know, so there is the ridership data, there is the um, more informal data that's been collected by different kinds of uh, apps and other small organizations. Uh, there is, so I think um, uh, you know nowadays we have I even Google can provide a fair amount of data of what who's moving, how people are moving. We know that people now are now accessing cell towers to understand how many people are at different points. So also to understand where are the people at what time so that we are being able to provide the, the transport at that point. So I think, um, I think we have to be a little uh, innovative also in accessing different data sources uh, and having a lot more data open so that 
uh, those people who can use the data to make decisions uh, or to inform governments uh, to make more data informed decisions um, i think i do believe that actually if you give data governments are more willing to listen i mean that's something i have definitely found so that is one way of pushing governments to make those decisions if we can provide them that data from different sources ramon did you want to or somebody from the audience Hi, this is Hamza Wain from PMHDTV. Um, basically, data, what you are looking at, you know, every city they have the police. So they have all the data which we need. Which area is safe, which area is unsafe. And then, of course, as uh, you mentioned about the Google and the, uh, and the services which you got from like Grab or other things, you know. So which area is the more uh, people want to travel from that area which is safe, which is unsafe. And the main thing is that executive, you know, the, the, the police and the, and the local bodies which are uh, you know, responsible uh, for implementing. The main thing is to implement the, the laws which are uh, in that city or whatever. So they, uh, police also overlook it because they are getting something from it. So they overlook, overlook and uh, they, they do benefit it from, you know, whatever it is. So main thing is executive has to be strong. They have to see that whatever they are implementing, the laws should be followed and properly followed and uh, heavier fines maybe uh, so that once people know that uh, you know uh, they are misusing whatever the facilities or whatever it is so they won't you know damage it or you know uh, they will uh, uh, you know the main thing is if they know that law is there and they have to follow otherwise they will be there will be a lot of heavy penalties to be then i think uh, it will be a b better and safer uh, environment uh, in which uh, people can you know live along clayton had his hand up over there <laughs> hi um, clayton lane currently with go metro uh, technology and planning firm based in south africa um, I'm going to answer a slightly different question on data, more about travel behavior, uh, which is also pretty invisible in most less developed countries. Um, we're about to do a really exciting project with CAF and IDB in Latin America to establish a mobility observatory for 29 cities. And this would generate data and indicators, really interesting things, mode share, travel time, affordability, GHG emissions, uh, 23 indicators. Um, and the way we'll go about doing it is just with a piece of software that we can install into any partner app. So the Sao Paulo Metro app or the Transmillennial app, for example, can have the software that can basically observe how people move around, um, what, whether they're walking, cycling, taking transit, driving, very much like Google is observing much, many of us in this room right now. <laughs> um, and we also will publish a mobile survey um, linked to that, the first set of data, that will ask people their demographics and some perceptions of, of their experience in, in mobility. Um, and so that, you know, those demographics will enable us to normalize the data, correct for bias, but also to report results by demographics. So mode share by gender, travel time by income, uh, perceptions of safety uh, by gender, and so on. So a really powerful data set, in addition to just the basic origins and destinations and travel times, which cities desperately need to do proper planning. So, you know, it's technology that hasn't quite been applied in this way before for a public purpose. Um, it's a brand new set of data, and we also hope to navigate some of these very tricky privacy issues to try to establish some good practice in privacy. Um, and, you know, if this works well, I'm excited to see what we could do in Africa, where there's even less data, but I think it's a whole new world. You know, I think Kalpana has herself, in her, in her work, already proven there are very innovative, exciting ways to generate data on what's happening in cities, and I think here's yet another one, and you know, I, I think that there's, a, there's a lot of innovation that can happen in coming years. Thank you. I know, Zahira, you had your hand up, but I know data is your thing, so I don't know if you wanted to, to make a comment on these questions. Yeah, I want... It's working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear myself. Okay. 
Um, I just have a comment about uh, road safety data coming from police. So we have another question, which is accuracy and quality of data. Because police, um, the main objective of collecting data is dividing responsibility, like uh, finding who um, made the mistake for like uh, um, an example for a road crash accident. But our objective is to find why the factors behind this event, which is the accident. So it's not all the time uh, the best source of data is uh, police data. Uh, an example f uh, on the Arab region, they don't collect the uh, location of accident, like the correct location, X, Y. So we can't define where is the problem in roads. They put only a description of, um, for example, the name of the road or of the highway. They don't uh, locate exactly where. So we can't, uh, as uh, uh, engineers, transport engineers, for example, or road designers, we can't provide solutions because we don't, uh, we don't know where the uh, accidents occur exactly. Also, they don't describe, for example, um, the crash diagram, like is it uh, frontal or like the angles of, col uh, of accidents. So we can't, for example, um, define also, um, there is many, many gaps like in collecting data, so we can't uh, only c account on data collecting from, uh, collected from police. And the source of big data, like you said before, it's um, a huge like, um, and an important source for, for data. But I have a question for you. Using the application, it's, um, the person should um, uh, install and, get, uh, and also accept to give you the information, how do you do this? Because it's ki it's uh, kind of uh, personal data. How do they do? They provide you. And there is, uh, for example, uh, Google and here who provide some data on uh, on uh, transport mobility, but it's costly. It costs a lot. So if you can provide us with more details about your application, it would be great.